Translation When Yayati received this benediction from Shukracharya, he requested his eldest son, My dear son Yadu, please give me your youth in exchange for my old age and invalidity. So Yayati has just been cursed um, by his father in law, Shukracharya, to lose his youth as a result of. Um, complications he got into uh, with his wife and uh, her maid and um, a triangle essentially and um, uh, and then um, and then Shukracharya tells him okay you can have your youth back if you can find one of your sons to exchange that youth with 
So this is now a way out for him. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, so now he's going to go uh, uh, speak to his son, Yadu, uh, his eldest son, and ask him for uh, his youth in exchange for his old age. So here we are, text number 39. Please repeat. Mata maha kritam vatsa Mata maha Natrito vishayeshvaham Natrito vishayeshvaham Vayasa bhavadiyena Vayasa bhavadiyena Hamsye katipaya sama Hamsye katipaya sama Mata maha kritam vatsa Vishayeshvaham Natrito Vishayeshvaham Vayasa Bhavadiyena Vayasa Bhavadiyena Ramsye Katipaya Sama Ramsye Katipaya Sama Mata Maha Kritam Vatsa Mata Maha Kritam Vatsa Natrito Vishayeshvaham Natrito Vishayeshvaham Vayasa Bhavadiyena
for a few Sama years. years. Translation and purport by His Divine Grace, A.C. Bhaktivedanta Swami Prabhupada. My dear son, I am not yet satisfied in my sexual desires. But if you are kind to me, you can take the old age given by your maternal grandfather, and I may make and I may take your youth so that I may enjoy life for a few years more. Purport. This is the nature of lusty desires. In Bhagavad Gita it is said, Kamai stai stai rita jnana. When one is too attached to sense gratification, he actually loses his sense. The word hitagnana refers to one who has lost his sense. Here is an example. The father shamelessly asks his son to exchange youth for old age. Of course, the entire world is under such illusion. Therefore, it is said that everyone is pramatta, or ex exclusively mad. Nunam pramatta kurute vikarma. When one becomes almost like a madman, he indulges in sex and sense gratification. Sex and sense gratification can be controlled, however, and one achieves perfection when, one, when he has no desires for sex. This is possible only when one is fully Krishna conscious. Yadavadhi mama cheta krishna padara vinde navanavarasadhaman yudhyatam rantumasi tadavadhi bhatanari sangame smadiyamane Bhavati Mukha Vikara Shushtu Nishti Vanamcha. Since I have been engaged in the transcendental loving service of Krishna, realizing ever new pleasure in Him, whenever I think of sex pleasure, I spit at the thought and my lips curl with distaste. Sexual desire can be stopped only when one is fully Krishna conscious and not otherwise. As long as one has desires for sex, one must change his body and transmigrate from one body to another to enjoy sex in different species or forms. But although the forms may differ, the business of sex is the same. Therefore it is said, puna punash Those who are very much attached to sex transmigrate from one body to another with the same business of chewing the chew, tasting sex enjoyment as a dog, sex enjoyment as a hog, sex enjoyment as a demigod, and so on. Om Jnana Timiram Dasya Jnana Anjana Shlake Chakshurun Mirtam Jena Dasmai Shri Gurave So I remember um, uh, as an 11 or 12 year old, something like that, uh, reading this section and other such sections like this in the Bhagavatam uh, with my mother and younger brother um, and uh, turning all in red and multi hues of very odd feelings um, coming out uh, reading these passages that are so explicit about um, uh, sexual activity, about the attraction between a man and a woman, about the physical beauty of women and of men, and what attracts them in very direct language. And um, uh, and, uh, you know, it was, it was awkward, no doubt. I was just at the age where these things become interesting. And I was with my mother uh, at the same time. And um, uh, many times people ask uh, me, my mother, well, what do you do about such sections in Srimad Bhagavatam, especially when it comes to children? Uh, I, I'm experiencing it now with my own children who are reading Srimad Bhagavatam and uh, know a, a lot about sex life uh, through Srimad Bhagavatam. <laughs> it not, <laughs> not quite sure what it means, but they understand the language, they understand the, the, the category, the ideas. There's man, there's woman, they're attracted to each other, there's physical differences. Uh, and, I mean, the reality is that we live in a world, we always have, where these things are ever present all around us, but especially now, uh, it's it's very difficult to keep anyone, including children, uh, innocent of matters like these. And in school, uh, one has sex education. I don't know if it happens here in Belgium, but in the United States, it's a pretty common thing uh, at a certain age, and then it grows in detail and grows in advice and so on. 
Um, so why not get it from Srimad Bhagavatam? Uh, the beauty of Srimad Bhagavatam is it takes all of that and it puts it into perspective. We see sexual activity, we see sexual desire as it happens between Kardama and Devahuti, uh, which is glorious, it's wonderful. It, it results in the birth of the Supreme Lord as their son and perfection for both mother and father. And we see that same activity in relation to Kashyap. It takes these matters and it puts it into wonderful perspective. It shows us how it's done, it shows us what its meaning is, it shows us um, the, both the pleasures and the dangers of it, and does it in actually a very interesting and very balanced way. Um, and so here in this purport, uh, Prabhupada is uh, talking about the terrible quality of lusty desire and um, how we have to get rid of sexual desire in order to make it back to Godhead. And just looking at this verse on its own, one might come to the conclusion that getting married and having children and family life and all of that is a terrible thing to do and more or less akin to, to fall down, as indeed we've thought many, for a long time in our own movement. Uh, and yet, if we, we read just the next verse and the next purport, Prabhupada changes the tone significantly. And not only does he allow for family life, but makes it an imperative. And this is a result of the reply that Yadu gives to his father. He says, unless one enjoys material happiness, one cannot attain renunciation. And Prabhupada takes that point and emphasizes it again and again and again and again. And so this is the second point I wanted to make about method. The first was that we don't need to shy away from these sections of Srimad Bhagavatam for anyone. They're actually um, very wonderful. In fact, one of, I think, the most unfortunate things we do with Bhagavatam in relation to children is when we turn it into mere moral stories or, or value stories, where we'll take the story of Dhruva, for example, and boil it all down to just one point. You have to be determined, right? So go off and do your studies well, because if you're determined, you're going to succeed. And we take another story and we boil it down to, you know, honor your mother and honor your father. And we take another story and we boil it down to some other very trite moral that the children have heard a hundred times, a thousand times from everyone in their life. When the reality is that those are truths, of course, that are present in Bhagavatam, but the Bhagavatam is so much more complex and so much more varied than what we initially think it to be. And then we, we insult our children's intelligence by thinking them incapable of understanding, of appreciating that complexity. Take a, take a look at the story of Dhruva, for example. Uh, yes, of course, it's about determination. <clears throat> but it's so, so much more. It's a story where this young boy has a conflicting relationship with his father. Something that, well, at some point our children may experience. And then he, uh, um, uh, he goes off and he's unable to follow the instruction of his superior. So while story after story tells us, follow the instructions of your guru, follow the instructions of your parents, he's not able to do that when Narada Muni comes to him. He says, I, I just can't. I, I, I have these certain ambitions, I have these desires. And then we see someone later on in the story who struggles significantly with anger. He tells Narada, basically, I'm too angry to go home and just be humble and accept everything in the way that Prasad did. And then later on in the story, when his younger brother is killed by the Yakshas, uh, Dhruva, he completely loses his cool and he starts to kill the Yakshas left and right till who is the Swami Bhagavan or Brahma, comes and says, calm down, it's okay, don't, you don't have to kill so many people for this, and, and, and holds him back, and, and saves him from, from a lot of sinful activity. So we see someone who is very rich, and with whom our children can identify, at different periods in their life, the different aspects of that story will become meaningful to them. But if we only give them a little sliver of that story, we give them the boiled, watered down, or uh, essentialized version of it, uh, the, the one thing, then we've divested them 
of something that's so useful for the entire course of their lives. At this point, they may need to know the, the, this, the, the, the message of determination to make it through school, but later on, they may, may need to know the message of what to do when you don't like one of your parents, or what to do when you're insulted, or what to do when you're really angry. That message will stay with them if they understand the Bhagavatam in all its richness. And so I've found uh, in studying Srimad Bhagavatam that every story, no matter how one-sided or um, difficult it seems to digest, it seems to, 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 to accept, to digest, it's always a lot richer, more complex, more detailed, uh, and there's always a balancing factor that's there that speaks to multiple audiences. Uh, many examples can be given, but I won't go in that uh, direction right now, just to focus on the story at hand. But this story also is very rich in its aspects. And here in this purport, Prabhupada emphasizes one side of it. Uh, right? He's saying um, sexual desire is a problem. And the evidence of someone who is advanced in Krishna consciousness is that they have conquered that desire. Uh, and there's no ifs and buts. And there is no moderating sentences in this purport at all. And yet, if we read the next purport, Prabhupada goes with the flow of Srimad Bhagavatam and provides a, a wonderful argument that you'll hear tomorrow for why it is not only okay but essential that the vast majority of persons in society go through the process of experiencing pleasure, dhamma, in this world in order to come to a point where they no longer need to experience it because they are more or less satisfied. Uh, and uh, this is something, another point of method to remember in studying Srimad Bhagavatam is that the nature of commentary, not just Srila Prabhupada's commentary, but all throughout our history in our Sampradaya, the nature of the commentary is that the commentator must take what's present in the verse and amplify it and strengthen it. So if the verse is saying that um, Yayati is embarrassing himself, by asking his son, saying, ah, I want to have more pleasure with your mother. Can I have your youth? And if, if, if he's embarrassing himself, it's the job of the commentator to bring that out, to strengthen it, to show us the, method, the, the, the message and how profound it is. And so Prabhupada amplifies it. He strengthens it, strengthens it with this a famous verse from Yamunachari, that when I think of sex life, my lips curl in distaste and I spit at the thought. And then in the next verse when Yadu says, but actually Father, I don't want to give you my use because unless I need to experience this, unless one experiences pleasure in this world, we cannot come to the point of renunciation. Prabhupada emphasizes that and he says, this is why it's so important that every person must experience this, well not every person, he says most persons, must experience this in order to um, make it to the point of becoming truly attached to Krishna and becoming detached from the material world. Uh, and so in, in our world, in our Facebook world, where it's so easy to pull one thing and to put a frame around it and just amplify it on its own, it's so important to remember that any time we read a verse or a purport or anything like that, we read what comes before it, we read what, what comes after it, uh, we read it in context. Same thing with Srila Prabhupada's lectures, uh, where he's amplifying a particular point, but in another lecture, he'll amplify another point. Uh, and both have to be held together and seen as a whole. So, uh, here we have a rather um, we have a tension that's present. On the one hand, uh, uh, Yadu uh, uh, will say that um, I, I need to experience this enjoyment, this sense pleasure, in order to come to the point of renunciation eventually. And that's my goal. On the other hand, um, so the idea is by experiencing it, uh, we can become satisfied. 
eventually, so that we no longer feel it's a need of any kind of pleasure in this world. And yet we also understand that faith, we, we know that famous analogy uh, that uh, when we try to satisfy material desire, what happens? All that happens is that we ignite the fire further, like pouring fuel into a fire. That analogy actually comes from this chapter, sorry, the next chapter in Shiva Bhagavan, this very story. It's Yayati himself who says this at the end of his whole journey and says, uh, if the more fuel you pour into a fire, the brighter it's going to burn. And therefore, one should not be alone with a woman, even if that person is their mother or daughter. Right? He makes that statement, which sounds so drastic. And yet, in context, we realize it's coming from a man who took his whole life to see that and twice had to experience youth in order to come to the point of being able to say, no, I don't want to be alone with a woman because I don't need that stimulation. See, again, if you see it in context, you realize that's the point at which this person is able to say that, not that this is a statement that we ought to show to newly married grihastas and say, don't be alone with your wife because oh, your desires are going to be excited. And that makes absolutely no sense. So, um, that tension is there in this story. Uh, is it the way? Do we reject it completely? Um, or do we experience it? And will that experience of pleasure come bring us to the point of satisfaction? Or will the experience of pleasure simply increase our desire for more pleasure? And the answer is both. Uh, when we experience that pleasure in proper um, regulation, in proper context, in proper social structure, then the experience of pleasure leads directly to renunciation. And when that pleasure is unstructured, it's outside the regulations given in the scriptures and given by any civilized society, then the experience of pleasure, far <coughs> from satisfying, leads simply to more, desire for more and more. And more and more debauched forms of uh, pleasurable experience because that satisfaction is not present. So the key is that do we do it within that regulative structure? And what is that regulative structure? It, it's, not, it's actually not all that uh, complicated to figure out. Uh, every society in the world, every religious tradition in the world more or less says the same thing about what makes a human being a human being. Uh, there's no religion in the world that does not recommend that sexual desire be fulfilled within the context of married life. Every religion in the world asks us, be careful with what you eat, especially if you're eating animal flesh or blood. Every religion in the world says, gambling is not going to make you a person of good character, it's not good for you, intoxications, is, so this, these, are, these are very very stable and very essential things. They're, one doesn't have to be a great scholar in the Vedas to understand what that regulative framework is. But when we practice it within that framework, then desire becomes um, fulfilled. It's not eradicated, but we come to a point where we're able to look at it and say, actually, this isn't really taking me anywhere. This wasn't really what I was after to begin with. That sensual pleasure was okay, it was nice, it was good when I experienced it, but it's not something that is endless in nature. I've kind of had enough, and I'm ready to move on. I'll give an example that's maybe a little bit less um, uh, uh, embarrassing, and that's when it comes to food, right? When, when for, for our children, when we feed them as sumptuously as we can, satisfy their desires for whatever type of uh, stimulation they have in terms of food, they grow up to a point where at a certain age they're, they're satisfied. They're, they're, they're not the, the, um, uh, the, 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 the desire for more and more in terms of the stimulation of the taste buds. It kind of calms down and it's one is able, or this is true even not just of children, but our early years in Krishna consciousness, that we eat and we eat and we eat and we eat, 
And at a certain point, we say, okay, this is, this is good. You know, this is enough. I, I can skip the halava this time. I can skip this this time. I actually do enjoy the salad a lot. And, and it's just a, it's a natural process, right, that emerges as a result. <laughs> so this is true of every form of enjoyment. And what's really interesting is that in the ninth canto of Srimad Bhagavatam, specifically, we find stories like this. Story, stories that are rather embarrassing in terms of uncontrolled sensual desire, but then offer a path out of it through the regulation of the same thing, through a connection with Krishna. That it's not only regulated, but there's a higher goal. There's a sense of, okay, where am I going with this? Right? We enter it, we enjoy it fully, with some kind of higher goal or direction in mind. So, just before this, in the canto, we find the story of uh, Pururava and Urvashi. Uh, Pururava was a great king in the Lunar Dynasty, and uh, one of the early kings of the Lunar Dynasty. And he fell in love with the Apsara, uh, Urvashi, and it, the feeling was mutual. They got married, and the whole story is um, I mean, up to a certain point, it's just a love story. It's just a romance, through and through. They fall in love with each other. He asks her, can I marry you? And she says, yes, of course, but they, I have three conditions. Um, I'm only going to eat ghee. Uh, I've got two pet goats. And you have to make sure that these goats you protect with your life. So apparently it's possible to have the same kinds of relationship with goats that people have with dogs. Right? that you just really, really love them, and she loved these two goats. And then the third is that I should never, ever see you naked. Okay. So, three things, and he says, no problem. And they get married, and uh, Indra eventually wants Urvashi back in his court. She's a heavenly upsetter, uh, and so he sends the Gandharas down, and they hatch a plot where they steal the, the goats, the goats cry out, uh, um, Urvashi cries out and um, insults uh, Gururava's manliness and says, you're good for nothing, you're not actually a man, you can't even protect two goats. And he gets really insulted, and he runs out uh, and jumps out of bed and runs to protect them. But just at that moment, the Gandharvas uh, shine their brightness and brilliance, and he's completely naked, and she sees her, and all, well, two out of the three conditions are broken, and Urvashi disappears in a flash. Bururava's life is devastated. He wanders the world like a madman, looking for Prabhupada. The word Prabhupada uses here is to become exclusively mad, he says, Pramatta. He wanders this world like a madman, and uh, he, um, he finds Urvashi again and begs her to come back. And she gives him one day a year uh, that they're together. And this is not sufficient, it doesn't suffice, so he prays to the Gandharvas and eventually uh, is able to rejoin Urvashi in her world, in the world of the Apsaras. So at that point, we have what seems like a happily ever after story. It's over. The two are rejoined and they live happily ever after. But the Bhagavatam doesn't stop. In fact, this is a very ancient story, all the way back from the Rig Veda. It's the oldest written love story in the world. And most of the versions end with the happily ever after. But the Bhagavatam doesn't. It doesn't stop there. It continues. And when Pururava gets to the heavenly planets with Urvashi, and he's got what he's wanted his whole life, he looks at himself at some point and he says, this just isn't satisfying. This wasn't what I was after. It's not giving me the happiness I wanted. And he decides to leave home and become a wandering mendicant, constantly traveling and singing the glories of the Lord. That's more or less what happens with Yayati as well. Yayati goes through all of this, enjoys for a thousand years, and then comes back to tell his wife, Devayani, this story. 
It's, it's a funny thing. He gives the story of a he-goat and a she-goat. So there's some resonance with the Puruda story because there's two goats. <laughs> he says there was a he-goat and there was a she-goat and the she-goat fell into a well and the he-goat pulled her out. And then he essentially tells their story. And then at the end of it he says, oh, and I'm the he-goat and you're the she-goat. And you can just imagine Deviani sitting there going, yeah, I, as if I didn't guess. <laughs> like our story. Um, so he, he tries to be subtle, but he's pretty close in the way he describes the story. And he says, look, even after all this time, he says exactly the two words he says in this verse. Na atripyat. I was not satisfied. Same thing he says. He tells his son right now, I'm not satisfied. At the end of 1,000 years of pleasure, he comes around and he says the same thing. I'm still not satisfied. But this time, he knows what to do. And he heads off to perfect his life. Devayani, the Bhagavatam says, perfects her life, and they both end up becoming liberated. This is wonderful. Right? This is a uh, husband and wife can mutually protect each other. They can help each other both experience dharma, artha, kama, and come to the point of recognizing that we need to work towards moksha. This is the great gift of family life. It's the great gift of a marriage. Is that the husband and wife can support each other. And it, it varies. Uh, sometimes one of the two partners is the one who prods a little bit more. And sometimes it's the other one who pushes in that direction. In fact, in the two stories I told you, Pururava and the one we're reading, the Yati, it's different. In Pururava's story, it's actually Urvashi who tells him, before he comes to heaven to join her, he, she tells him, she says, this is not going to make you happy. I'm not what you're looking for. The pleasure you're getting is what she's talking about. That the sensual pleasure, the physical pleasure you're looking for is not what's going to make you happy. You need to rethink this. And he doesn't listen. And when he finally comes to his senses, he comes back and says, I received good advice from her. She spoke Vedic hymns to me. In essence, she was my guru. She told me what I felt, what I, what I was going to feel, and why this was not going to be satisfying. And yet, I did not listen to her. And in the Yayati story, it's the husband. It's Yayati who pr prompts his wife and says, you know, this is our story. And uh, this isn't going to make us happy. I think we need to, to find uh, the next stage. We need to, we've experienced this, and it was good, but it's not ultimate. So let's move on. And she gets it. She gets it right away. She's also satisfied. She's had her children. She's had a good life. She's experienced the pleasures she wants. He's experienced the pleasures he wants in regulated fashion and within the context of good culture. And he, he's ready to move on and she gets it and she's ready to move on and they both become perfect. Of course, Kardamuni and Devahuti are famous examples of the same. So the Bhagavatam again and again, it provides us stories of people who are really in the thicket. They're in the weeds. They're really in rather embarrassing situations. Right? Diti's situation is rather embarrassing in Bhagavatam, the way she's pulling at her husband's poti. Right? And Yayati's position here, it's really embarrassing. Right? But, I mean, for all his having no shame, he's painfully honest about who he is. And in the next verse, we're going to hear how Yadu is also painfully honest, right? This is the virtue that gets them both out of this embarrassing situation. Is It takes a lot for a father to be able to go to his son and admit a mistake. What to speak of this kind of moral failing? That I did something that caused me to lose my youth. That's on me. And yet, I want that from you so I can enjoy this pleasure. I want to reverse the natural order of things. And Yadu is 
really honest in his reply. And this is why the Bhagavatam and Srila Prabhupada praise him. That he's able to come and say, I'm not ready for this, Father. I, I need to experience this myself. I need my youth. I need to go through the process that you want to go through. I don't want to lose that opportunity because otherwise I won't be ready for when the time is right to renounce. I will be there. And uh, Dhruva is honest with Narada Muni. He says, I'm not ready to go home. Even though Prabhupada in the purport says this, and Narada's instruction is right. We should be humble and we should you know, tolerate. But he says, no, I'm a kshatriya. I can't do that. That's not my nature. Show me another way. Show me another path out. So each of these devotees is very honest. There are people who are in the thickets, who are in the weeds, who are, who are um, really in embarrassing situations. And yet, the Bhagavata shows us that there's always a way through. If we look carefully enough, regardless of what we're tormented by in this material world, there's always a trail out of the forest. We just have to find it. Each one of us in this world is tormented by something or another. And everyone in Bhagavatam is tormented by something different. For some of us, it may be the torment of too much lust, like with Yayati and like Purudava. For others, it might be the torment of a family member, like Praha, who's abused by his father. For others, it might be the torment of a difficult marriage, like Sukanya and her uh, husband, um, irritable husband, Javan. For some, it may be uh, a, 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 another kind of torment, a torment of greed and ambition, like with Bali Maharaj and his desire to have more and more and more. Everyone in this world is tormented by something. But the Bhagavatam's message is one of great hope. The Bhagavatam is telling us, no matter what it is that is our personal torment, in that forest, there's always a path out. And the best way out is through. When we go through it, that's the best way out. Not trying to fly over it, or burrow under it, or go around it, but right through it. And then when we get to the other side, we can look back and we can, sit, we can say, yes, I've experienced that. And no, it's not ultimately satisfied. That I've come to recognize the first instruction of Bhagavad. Finally, that the only thing that can truly satisfy the self is when I develop the bhakti for Krishna. And that's what I want to focus on. That all my relationships have been supporting me. They've been leading me in this way. And for them I am so grateful. Not embarrassed, but grateful. At the end of Pururava's story, he expresses his gratitude to Urvashi. For by her companionship, that relationship has brought him to this point. Same thing with, with Karnam Muni, same thing with Yayati. And so that's the Bhagavatam's message again and again, showing us that through the thickets there's a trail out. And that trail leads us to Krishna if we experience what we have to, if we go through the process, we have to go through the way of experiencing our desires, but in the context of Krishna. Two things. One, in a space of regulation, so there's limits, there's boundaries, that are the boundaries of human life, essentially, and that there's a goal in mind, there's a connection to Krishna all the way through. And how do we know? How do we know that we're going through it in a way that is going to lead us to the point of freedom from desire, rather than pouring more fuel in the fire? How do we know that we're actually doing it with sufficient regulation, with sufficient connection to Krishna? We know that if our desire for Krishna, our desire to go home to Krishna does not die out. If the flame 
of desire to get there is still burning strong within our hearts, then we know that this is working. If the hankering to say, I'm not there yet and I can't, I can't make it and my sadhana succeeds and then it falls and my, I, I, I make mistakes and then I recover and it happens over and over again, am I making progress or am I just turning my wheels? If that fire of bhakti, that desire to get to the other side, to get to the point where we can stand before Krishna and say, Krishna, I feel so much relief. I know that this is, I, I've got you, you are the person who's going to satisfy you. We know we'll get to that point if that desire for that point is strong within our hearts. If that flame still burns brightly, then we know that it's okay. We'll get there. And this is we find in the songs of Srila Bhakti Murtakur, right? when he sings that beautiful song, Gopinath. He's Vishani Durjan, Sada Bapedata. He's saying, I'm Sada uh, Kamara. He's saying, I'm always embarrassed by this gama, by this desire, this lust. Vishani Durjan, I'm engaged in my senses. But through the song, despite his criticism of himself, what shines brightly is his unfailing desire, is that burning inside, for I want you, Krishna. I want you. And so he even argues with Krishna. And that's one of my, my um, favorite all-time uh, verses from Bhaktivinoda Thakur, where he says, Asura sakal paino charana he says, Krishna, even the demons achieved you. Mm -hmm. And look at me. I'm still waiting here for your mercy. Is this fair? <laughs> <laughs> this is some spirit on the part of the devotee who is willing to argue with, with Krishna and say, this isn't good. Shishupa, Kamsa, all of these people are getting your shelter. Bhutana, and I'm actually trying here to serve you with love. <laughs> and we know that Taki was Boshi. Here I am Boshi, I'm sitting. And I'm waiting. When is it going to happen? When are you going to get So his, his desire is burning strong. So this is, this is, this is our, our hope. This is our test. That as we practice bhakti, uh, it's, it's a very wonderful thing. Because it's not an escape from our situation. It's a return. It's a return home. When we keep that desire in front of us, that I want to go home, I know, Krishna, that this is what's going to make me happy. But I need to do my thing. And I'm sorry, but I need to experience this. Then we express that eagerness to Krishna, to achieve Him, combined with that honesty of where we, where, where we are at. At Utsaha, Nishchaya, Dhyaya. Our honesty, this is where I'm at, combined with our enthusiasm, this is where I want to be. And if both things are present, the honesty and the enthusiasm, then success is absolutely assured. If one of the two start to wane, where we're enthusiastic and not honest at where we're at, then that's a recipe for stumbling. Because we think we've become far purer than we actually are and we take leaps that we cannot sustain. Or, if there's honesty, but that honesty is not matched with enthusiasm, with a sense of desire to get home to Krishna, then the honesty becomes an excuse for just being who you are. I'm not a pure devotee, there's nothing I can do. I am who I am. And then we don't progress. But that combination of honesty and a sense of goal, a sense of desire of return, that's magic. Right? And that's what we find in each one of these instances. With Pururava, with Yayati, uh, with uh, Kardaman Devahuti, is that combination of stark honesty, almost embarrassing honesty, but with great determination, with great enthusiasm for the goal, with a recognition of where this is all leading. 
So I will stop there and see if anyone has any comments or thoughts or questions that we can discuss. So, you, 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 thank you. It was a very uh, class, stimulating class. Um, one thought comes to mind, especially at the conclusion. You seem to imply uh, or almost assume clarity. Like, I know where I am and I'm just going to maintain my enthusiasm or I'm really you know, active in my material things, but Krishna's where I want to go, or a different phase. But I'm just wondering, uh, you know, uh, in, in an attempt to follow your advice to be, to be as uh, honest with ourselves and others, I often find the lack of clarity is the biggest challenge. So sometimes it kind of feels like there's a whirlwind going on inside your mind. And I often relate to the, that Druid's pastime where he's told don't fight so aggressively, but also one of those periods of time he's completely bewildered by the mystical powers of the Yavas? Uh, yakshas. Yakshas. And he hears a voice, I always remember, was it, was it Swami Buddha or was it Brahma? I didn't so. Somebody tells him to shoot your arrow. And he's completely bewildered. And somehow he kind of like, with, with the last ounce of strength, without a whole lot of chutzpah in his arrow, he, it just leaves the end of his bow. There's just enough shakti in there to dissipate the other side. Like, got out of that one by, by some miracle, etc. So sometimes I feel there's like this lack of clarity, confusion. What phase am I at? Am I getting a little renounced or am I just getting my, whatever? But it's just keep going down the path. Just, just try to keep shooting in that arrow. Somehow chant the Lord's name. Somehow do a little something. Somehow do a little service. Without any sense of I'm making progress, as <coughs> if I stick to that. So, is that a reasonable response? Or, uh, or reflections on that? Yeah. No, I, I think that's a really wonderful point and an important one. Um, I, 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 uh, I, I, I 100% agree that that clarity is not, it's not crystal clear in the way that I was describing it. That, that what, the, the clarity that does emerge, I think Krishna shows us as much as we need to know at that moment in the way, or, or for the amount of time that we need to know, Krishna shows us what the next two steps are. And again, thinking of the trail in the forest, that that trail tends to disappear if you look too far out. But a, a few steps down, you can kind of see, okay, there's a trail marker there. I kind of know I need to go, and then I lose it at this point. But oh, there's one, there's one coming up ahead. So from here to there, it's not exactly clear. Oops, I think I should have gone that way. But if you if you do some hiking in the forest, you recognize that you have to kind of you have to kind of navigate a little bit on your own, kind of go blind for some time. But there's hopefully enough indications that we continue down that path. And so Krishna, it, it's very true. Krishna often doesn't. I mean. He never actually shows us the whole path. In fact, in one purport in, in Bhagavatam, this is in the story of, um, of uh, Bhishma, when Bhishma is on, on his, uh, on his uh, deathbed, and he's looking at the Pandavas, and he's saying, how are these devotees suffering? They're your personal friends. Why did this happen? And he goes through multiple reasons for their suffering. So Srila Vishwana Chakravarti Thakur, in his commentary, he says, Krishna, he always speaks in confusing ways. He never gives us a straightforward answer. Uh, this is Krishna's job. He always speaks in confusing ways. Bhishma, he, he, in fact, the question that Vishwanath asks, he says, why is it that if Bhishma is confused about this matter, why does he not just ask the Lord who's standing in front of him instead of saying, is it because of the force of time? Is it because of this or your karma? He should just ask Krishna, why did you do this? Mm -hmm. And, and Vishnu Chakravati Thakur says, Krishna always speaks or does things in intentionally confusing ways. He never tells us. And even if he were to tell us, we would not understand. We would not understand. And so, I, I think we, we, in terms of the honesty, we know certain things about ourselves and we try to be honest. But then Krishna always helps us be honest and the devotee community by showing us things about ourselves that we didn't recognize were actually 
there, right? They'll pull things up and they'll say, see, see, this is you. And we'll say, no, 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 it's not me, it's not me, this is, that was him, right? And we'll try to, try to deflect it and ignore it and so on. But Krishna always shows us and helps us to be more honest. So even with the honesty thing, I think you're 100% right, that that honesty is not 100% there as a given, oh, I know who I am. Because we don't know who we are, we know something of ourselves, but Krishna shows us more about who we are. And one day he'll show us our swarupa, and then we'll know even more of who we are. And then similarly, uh, when it comes to the goal, Krishna doesn't show us the whole path, or even what the end necessarily looks like in its full glory, but he shows us enough that we can kind of stumble to the next trail marker, and then from that point, make it to the next one, and in this way, make progress. Because his being intentionally circuitous is him building our faith. Right? It's him helping us to recognize, look, I'm not going to be clear to you, but I'm going to give you enough indication that this is where you need to go. Do you trust me enough to go there? And then we make some progress, and our trust in Krishna grows. And we make more progress, and our trust grows even deeper. So Krishna, he navigates this in a wonderful way. Uh, so those qualities are important, but thank you for that, because the process by which we uncover that about who we are and what the goal is, is, is a rather, um, uh, yeah, it's, it's exciting, adventurous process. I wonder if you can say something about this. Um, when I travel, I meet devotees who, they, they don't want to read Krishna book to their children because they think there's so much violence and they want their children to be um, inoculated from what they consider to be the violence in Christian's pastimes. And I was even in one place where one of my god sisters is not allowed, she's a teacher, and she's not allowed to tell the, the um, temple president, doesn't want her to tell these stories unless they're, you know, just as you said, sort of sterilized, and, you know, without the violence. So can you say something about that for parents? The Bhagavatam is really vile. It's a violent text. There's rivers of blood with hands and heads bobbing up and down in that river. And Vishnadev is, is, what was it? Hung, drawn, and quartered. He's, he's, he's cutting open Hiran Kashipu with his nails and taking out his intestines. And if he's, as if, if he's not dead at the end, he then tears out his heart and holds it up. And it's just from Indiana Jones, practically. There's this Bhagavatam is a violent, violent book. But, but so is the world. It's a very, I mean, we protect our children by not letting them read Krishna book or certain sections of it. And then we send them to school where bullying is a severe problem. Where, I mean, in the United States, they will hear about shootings regularly in schools, even if they don't experience it themselves. Maybe even down the hall. Yeah. In the next classroom they hear someone yeah, shooting. Maybe even school. down the hall. They, there's, there's, there's violence saturated. They'll, they'll, they'll listen to movies. There's violence saturated everywhere. Right? And yet we protect them from putting that violence in proper perspective. The Bhagavatam takes the violence and it shows us this kind of violence leads to this kind of result. In Vrindavan, only Krishna and Balaram kill demons. That sends a very powerful message, right, to the devotee. That when faced with a demon, I don't have to kill them. I don't have to take out a sword and chop someone's head off. Krishna will protect me. Right? That's a very powerful message for a child to know that the monsters, Krishna will take care of them. We see what happens when violence is uncontrolled and how damaging that is, and how it is controlled in Bhagavatam. Like in the Prachetas, as they're burning the, all these trees, like, like Dhruva, as he's, he's, he's killing uh, all the yakshas. Right? So the Bhagavatam puts all of this in a wonderful perspective, in a very balanced way. OK, uh, two more minutes. Shabana Um In the beginning of the class, as my mind was drafting towards a question which you Addressed in the class at the end of the ashram and the class of what should it be, what's going to conclusion. But still, if I find on a broader approach to my devotional service, certainly myself, I'm eternally dissatisfied. I'm just perpetually catching to shaking. 
and yet the devotee is touched, the devotee is satisfied. So is there, so basically what's the relationship between, is the devotee satisfied or is it not satisfied or is it healthy, unhealthy? What's the relation between satisfaction and dissatisfaction? Uh, I, I, I remember Prabhupada's uh, famous sentence that Shri Pachyaji Guru highlights. What is the difficulty? Right? And then in another place he says, one who is Krishna conscious is always happy. And the thing is, well, yes, there's no difficulty. We are always happy. Why? Because Krishna is there. What is the difficulty? And yet, there are so many difficulties. And there are so many reasons to be unhappy. So we can think of the Brajvasis, right? The Brajvasis are constantly in challenging situations. When Indra is sending down the force of rain, they're not like, quote unquote, satisfied or, or you know, totally, what is the difficulty? Yes, they are, what is the difficulty? Because Krishna is there. That's why there is no difficulty. But it doesn't negate the fact that they have to experience the torrential rain and that their houses are destroyed and that that's a challenge. Or when Keshi comes, it doesn't negate the fact that everyone in Vrindavan is scared of the Keshi demon as he's tromping around. That doesn't go away. Devotees in Bhagavatam are always scared, they're always worried, they're always in situations that are difficult, and they experience genuine human emotions, a whole variety of them. But what is the difficulty? Because Krishna is there. Okay? So yes, it's yes and no. We're satisfied, but also, there are all kinds of reasons not to be. Uh, to be present in the moment and to experience what we have uh, here before. So those two things are not contradictory. It's not that when we become a devotee, it's like being on drugs, where we're just, we're in a, in, we're in a state <coughs> where we're kind of always stimulated and always happy. Nothing really matters. There's no instance of a devotee like that in Bhagavad Gita. Every devotee feels what's there in a, in a genuine human way. And yet, what is the difficulty? Krishna is there to bring it. So we stop here. Thank you so much for your attention. Shiva Bhagavatam ki ki
Well, it's in the collection. This is oh, with that one. Uh, it's pretty cool. That seems to be Christ-like approach. Yeah. 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 Just like the coverage. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
question based on the
Yeah. 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 So, no, 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 I don't know. These past tours, I don't know. Yeah. But next year, I think we have two more Okay. And then we go to Fiji. I'd love to see your boys. Yeah, all this one's done. 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 Yeah, all this one's